Think of how happy you would be if you found a treasure. I think all of us would like that experience. A guy by the name of Rob Cutshaw, several years ago, he was uh, a rock collector, and he had a, a little shop, a rock shop, uh, along the roadside outside of Andrews, North Carolina. And so he would collect rocks, and then he would sell them to other collectors or jewelry makers. And uh, had a little business, but didn't make much money. Sometimes he would have to cut wood on the side to pay for the bills. One day he was out digging and he discovered a rock. It was different in color. It had a blue tint to it and uh, was bigger than normal, about a pound in weight. <clears throat> and so he thought, well, maybe I can get $500 for this rock and tried to sell it, but nobody would buy it. So he put it away in his closet on the shelf and 20 years later he pulled it out and thought, you know, I'll try again. And little did he know that he possessed the largest sapphire in the world that was eva evaluated at $2.75 million, the Star of David. And uh, he couldn't believe it. His life forever changed. I want to ask you, what is the treasure you're seeking? And if you find it, do you think that will make you happy? There are a lot of people who have found the treasure they're seeking and they would tell you today it doesn't satisfy. Because we're going to discover that happiness is really not what life is about. The Bible speaks to it in different terms than the word happy. It's about finding fulfillment. It's about finding purpose. It's about experiencing God's blessing. Uh, when Jesus spoke on the Sermon on the Mount and gave the Beatitudes, blessed are, happy are those. That's the idea of it. And so today we're going to learn from the Apostle Paul, the true source of happiness. If you're a guest, I'm beginning a series. In fact, go ahead and open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> and as you do, for those who are guests, we just finished a study in the book of Malachi. I love going through uh, books of the Bible but also, uh, sometimes we, we talk about what are some issues that we need to address and speak to. And this is one of them as we lead up to Christmas season. Everybody's looking for happiness and fulfillment. Our culture is longing for it. <clears throat> and people are doing crazy things to find happiness. Uh, it's, it's something that is so fleeting. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4 <clears throat> Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth was in the crossroads of travel, of commerce. It was a very corrupt place. In fact, if you were a bad person, they would call you a Corinthian, those who lived during that day. They, it was a, a derogatory term that was used, a very, very sinful place. But uh, Paul is writing to this church, and they were having a lot of problems. In fact, the first letter that he wrote addresses many of those, and also in this letter. And Paul is talking now <clears throat> about something that is related to this idea of treasure. All right, Notice what he says in verse 7. Now we have this treasure in clay jars, so that this or extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. We are pressed in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, <clears throat> but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who live are always given over to death because of Jesus. So that Jesus' life may also be revealed in our mortal flesh. <clears throat> so death works in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith in accordance with what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and present us with you. For all this is because of you, so that grace, so that grace extended through more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to God's glory. 
Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What is the true source of happiness? Paul is talking about this in the context of suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's usually the time and place where we're looking for a way to find happiness. We're trying to find relief in the pressure that we're in, the circumstances of our lives. Notice, first of all, God's treasure produces power within us. God's treasure produces power within us. Verse 70 says we have this treasure. Well, what is the treasure? In the context of chapter 4, it's Jesus Christ, and it's the gospel. It's the gospel message. It is the life that we have in Christ, the life that he gives us and brings to us, the new life. The old has passed away. We have a new life in Christ And that is the source, he gives it away right at the beginning, that that is the real source of happiness in our lives, of fulfillment. Now he says we possess this treasure, but it's in clay jars, which implies three things. First of all, it implies weakness. A clay jar will break, it will chip, it will crack. And Paul is comparing our weakness to God's power. That clay jar represents humility and lowliness. Uh, It's not a crafted Grecian urn, it's not a bronze vessel, it's not a goblet inlaid with gold, it is simply a clay jar, it's pottery. There's no beauty in contrast to the treasure. Also, he implies expendability. Clay jars had no value in that day. They were so cheap that they were thrown away. In fact, according to Jewish purity laws, it was impossible to consider a clay jar ritually clean When it became defiled, so it was simply discarded and thrown away. But the clay jar is very essential. A rabbinic tradition makes the comparison, just as wine cannot keep well in silver or gold vessels, but only in the lowliest of vessels, earthen ones, so words of Torah, that is the law, do not keep well in one who considers himself to be the same as silver or gold vessels but only in one who considers himself the same as the lowliest of vessels, earthen ones. God has not put his treasure in jars of gold, but in jars of clay. Now, why is that? Notice verse 7. So that this extraordinary power, this treasure, may be from God and not from us. Paul is showing that the treasure has nothing to do with the pot. No man can boast before God. We're nothing but literally cracked pots. We are flawed. We are afflicted. We are rejected. And yet God uses us to demonstrate his power. Paul said it like this in the first letter. God has chosen the world's foolish things to shame the wise. And God has chosen the world's weak things to shame the strong. God has chosen the world's insignificant and despised things, the things viewed as nothing, so he might bring to nothing the things that are viewed as something, so that no one can boast in his presence. Now Paul explains how God's power sustains you. The treasure within you keeps you from being shattered. Notice in verse 8, he says we are pressured, but not crushed. The word pressure means afflicted or squeezed and, and, and squeezed into a narrow place where there's no way out. He also says that you're perplex, we are perplexed but not in despair. Perplexed means to be at loss, that I'm in doubt about the circumstance. I'm, I, I don't know if God's going to come through. Uh, this, in this day and time, it was one who was been, had been ruined by its creditors and there at wit's end. You ever felt like that? You know, the financial squeeze is so hard, you don't know what to do, where to turn. He's saying we're stressed, but not stressed out. He says we're persecuted, but not abandoned. It means to hunt down like an animal does, to to pursue and persecute and take, possess, and kill the animal. 
We find that the scripture, Peter talks about how the devil is like that, how he's coming after us like a lion. To be abandoned means to be forsaken, especially in a time of difficulty. And Paul is not destroyed because Jesus Christ never abandoned him when others did abandon him. Maybe you feel that today. There are those who at one point were supportive of you, were by your side, were encouragers, were helpful to you, but they've gone. You feel abandoned. But the good news is is that Christ will never, ever abandon you. He says we are struck down but not destroyed. It's throwing an opponent down in wrestling. It is using a weapon, a spear to take down someone else. It means we're knocked down but we're not knocked out. We're going to get back up. We're in the ring. We're fighting. And uh, we took a big hit. We're down, and man, we almost were there with the count, but we got back up. God empowers us to stand again. Paul's attitude toward his suffering is in stark contrast with the other philosophers of his day, with the cynic and with the stoic. And they would say this, suffering proves my strength. It shows what we're made of, that we can handle any circumstance Paul says that suffering doesn't prove that I'm great. It proves that God is great. There's nothing about me in this. The Stoic would also say suffering has no impact on my happiness. Epictetus, one of the philosophers of the day, said this. Show me a man who, though sick, is happy, though in danger is happy, though dying is happy, though condemned to exile is happy, Though in disrepute is happy, show him, I fain would see a stoic. Well, Paul never speaks of happiness in the New Testament. He speaks of faith and hope and endurance, serving, making God happy. The stoic would also say suffering makes no difference to me. He's dispassionate about his suffering. But Paul is honest. He's really said, man, I'm hurting. I'm dying. I'm pressured, I'm perplexed, I'm persecuted, I'm struck down, but I will not be destroyed by the power of Christ that is in me. He's honest about it. God's treasure produces power within us. The source of true happiness is from him. Secondly, God's treasure reveals Jesus Christ to others. These verses reveal that the treasure, as I mentioned, is Jesus Christ And you see the cross and resurrection in the following verses. You see death and life. Notice in verse 10. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who live are always given over to death because of Jesus so that Jesus' life may also be revealed in our mortal flesh. So death works in us but life in you. So this treasure reveals Christ to others. And he's talking about this suffering that they're going through. And notice there are four aspects of this suffering. They're important to learn today. Number one, that suffering is constant. I mentioned a week or two ago, you're going to suffer for doing right or for doing wrong. And so he's talking about suffering for doing that which is right. Verse 10, he says, always. Verse 11, always giving over to death. This word carries in the present tense. It's something that is happening right now. It's it's normal. It's business as usual that if we're following Christ, if we're committed to him, that we're going to suffer for him. When he talks about always carry, he might have had the, the epiphany parades that took place of the cult groups that would carry their sacred objects representing what they believe. Well, the gospel doesn't need any of that. The gospel can stand on its own. It doesn't need anything to cover it or to highlight it or to make it shine brighter than it actually is. The danger is that people are so distracted by the glitter of the object, they ignore what it actually represents. That can happen with us and Christ and and the purpose of the church. We're simply a clay jar of suffering possessing the treasure of Christ. Notice he says not only is suffering constant, but it is purposeful. In verse 11 he says we're given over, we're handed over, that God allows suffering for a purpose. What is that purpose? Jesus Christ. 
He says, because of Jesus. That suffering is real. It's not a figment of our imagination. Suffering is relative. My suffering may be different from yours. But he talks about it in terms of the body and the flesh. And notice he says that suffering is beneficial. It's beneficial to us. Despite suffering, the power of Christ raises us to life again. That's what the word means. To stand again. And every day we're able to stand with whatever pressure we face. That the power of Christ brings life to us. When death seems all around us, we can stand again and again. And it's beneficial to others. Notice he says, so death works in us, but life in you. That means that we're willing to die for you so that you can experience that resurrection power, that life in you, the life of Christ in you. It's the attitude of being willing to give it all. Here's Paul's point. You have to embrace the cross life if you want to experience the resurrection life. You have to be willing to embrace the cross life if you want to experience the resurrection life. We all want the resurrection life. We all want the new life and the blessing and the good that comes. But that doesn't happen unless you're experiencing death around you. Unless you're willing to suffer for Christ. God's treasure reveals Christ to others. How do others see you responding to the pressure and the stress that you're under? Notice third, God's treasure brings glory to God. Verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith in accordance with what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and present us with you for all this is because of you. So that grace extended through more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to God's glory. Now there's a process there I'll get to in a moment that he speaks to. But here Paul is quoting from one, Psalm 116 verse 10. Anytime you see bold print in your Bible or italicized or it's blocked out, that's, that's a reference, that's a direct quote of the Old Testament. And so the psalmist is saying in the context of Psalm 116, although I am under attack, although I am afflicted, I believe that is the word in my translation, that I am going to give glory to God. I'm going to speak of Him. And Paul says that it doesn't matter what suffering we experience, it will not stop us from speaking of Christ and giving the gospel message. And in verse 15, notice he says, For all this, for all the suffering and all the preaching that I'm doing, this is what I'm experiencing. So notice what happens. First of all, we are preaching the gospel, we're witnessing, we're sharing Christ with others. And that often leads to suffering in some form or fashion. But out of that, we experience grace. God's gracious power at work to save others as you are being a witness for Christ. And then we experience thanksgiving. It leads to a grateful heart, which ultimately brings glory to God. So God's treasure brings glory to God. Notice also God's treasure radically transforms our lives. Verse 16. Powerful verses. Listen. Therefore, in light of the suffering, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. Not month by month, year by year. Day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now notice, how are we radically transformed by this treasure? By the source of happiness. First of all, it gives us boldness. He says we do not give up, we have courage. Also, we experience growth. We are being renewed. Outwardly, we're being destroyed, but inwardly, we are growing. There's also a reward. Something is going to happen later based on what we're experiencing now. And notice the contrast and comparison. As far as the nature of what we're going to experience, it's affliction today, 
but soon we'll experience God's glory. The time of our suffering is temporal. It seems like it's been going on forever. But he said, oh no, compared to eternity, this is nothing. I'm not making light of it. We just got to get, get, get the right understanding of what it's about. Uh, you know, as we learned before, if you look at, at a history on a timeline, you're a dot that's here 70, 80 years, maybe 90. And then you've got the rest of the line. So there is a short period of suffering, of affliction. But what we're going to experience, the reward that God gives us is eternal. Notice the magnitude of what we experience. He says, our momentary light affliction. It seems so heavy, doesn't it? It seems so weighty. But it's nothing compared to the weight of God's glory. That's what tips the scales. And notice he says that this reward is absolutely incomparable. He uses this hyperbole twice. He repeats it. In other words, it can be translated surpassing under surpassing. Beyond all measure, beyond all possibility of exaggeration. He's running out of superlatives to describe what we're going to experience. So God's glory far exceeds anything that we face today of suffering or affliction. Notice also your perspective is transformed in verse 18. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. What do we focus on? An earthly treasure. He says you need to focus on an eternal treasure. One that you can't see right now. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. You could have it all, but it's not going to make you happy. Chapter 4, verse 6, he says, For God who said, Let a light shall shine out of darkness, he has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the treasure. So in summary, God's treasure, Jesus Christ, is the true source of happiness. And once you possess that, God wants to use you to demonstrate the joy of this treasure. In spite of the trouble and the, the suffering, that he's given you joy. That's what real happiness is. It's not an emotion that comes and goes. But it's the character of Christ in us. God wants you to demonstrate the power of this treasure. Others see the transforming power of Christ in the midst of all that you're facing. And God wants to use you to demonstrate the glory of this treasure. That the way you respond points others to him. <clears throat> Several years ago, 2011 in fact, there's a temple in the south part of India. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name. It's this long. Uh, and they knew that there was a vault within this temple. And it had never been open for 130 years. There was rumor of a great treasure, but nobody knew for certain. And so those who worshiped there at this temple and those who were in the government agreed to open the vault. There were, it was almost like Indiana Jones. If you open the vault, bad things are going to happen. There's curses and all this. So they put it off, put it off, put it off. <clears throat> so finally they opened the, the vault. They realized there was the vault and they found great treasure, but there was an inner vault. It took several years to get to the inner vault, but they finally opened it as well. And what they discovered was over $1 trillion of gold and artifacts. It was unbelievable. The wealthiest religious place in the entire world, this temple. Compare that to the Vatican. If any of you have been to Rome and been through the Vatican, which I have and others have, that there are great artifacts, ancient artifacts. They have great wealth there. It's estimated that the wealth of the Vatican is roughly $15 billion. But in this temple, this religious site, one 
trillion dollars. Well, first of all, I want to ask, what are you going to do with all that? But, number, but, but the second thing, the most important is, none of that will satisfy the longing in your heart to be loved and fulfilled. You see, you can't buy happiness. There's nothing that exists that will bring ultimate happiness to you. Happy moments, but to find real purpose and meaning and why you're here and the value of your life, you can't put a price on that. There's a far greater gift, a far greater treasure that you're able to possess. And that is the treasure of Jesus Christ, God's unspeakable gift. How do you put a price on what Christ did for you on the cross? How much money would you have to pay to possess that? The forgiveness of sin. The power of Christ within you today. His wisdom. And to be able to spend all of eternity with Him. He possesses riches that no man can count. And He wants to give it all to you. So that you can understand what real happiness is all about. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? There might be somebody here today who would say, Pastor, I, I, I want to know God. I want to have a relationship with Him. I've tried to find happiness in all the wrong places. And it's not satisfying. And the reason is, is that there's a God-shaped void in your heart that only He can fill. You can't experience anything. You can't buy anything that will fill that void other than coming to the end of yourself dying to self and living unto Christ that means that you recognize that you have sinned against God we sang a few minutes ago all of God's wrath was placed on Jesus Christ the sins of the world were placed on him he took our punishment so that we could experience life with Him. So today I want to invite you the opportunity in just a moment when we sing to come to one of our pastors who will help you begin a journey of faith with God through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> there might be others who know the Lord, but, but for some reason you've taken for granted the treasure that you possess, the real source of your happiness. And you started going off down some side roads thinking that this will bring happiness, this will bring fulfillment to my life. But again, it all leads to a dead end. It goes nowhere. And God wants you to return to Him this morning. Let Him be the one who satisfies you. There might be others that God is leading to become part of our church family. Many have over this last month. And we want to invite you to come today to be a part of what God is doing here at our church. There are others who may want to come and pray quietly here at the front, at the altar, or you want someone to pray for you. Father, thank you that you have spoken to us through your word. Lord, to know that we can experience real happiness, but we have to go to the source, and that is Jesus Christ. Help these who need to make commitments now. In his name I pray. Amen. Let's quietly stand.